Hi, I'm Colleen and here's my March wrap up. Before we get into the wrap up, I'm gonna apologize as to why this video is super late. I usually like to have this come out before like the third of the next month. The last 18 days have been absolutely crazy for me. We started with my kids having spring break. One kid immediately vomited for 48 straight hours with basically no breaks. All the rest of the kids got colds. The same kid who vomited, his cold turned into pneumonia. He had pneumonia for a week. Finally, he got better. That cold turned into croup for my other kid a couple days ago. She's finally back at school today. Two days ago, our <laughs> Our plumbing backed up and so the sewer, like sewage, backed up into our shower. We thought we fixed it. I spent two hours Cloroxing our entire bathroom. And then last night it happened again. So we we have a plumber coming and I will have to re-Clorox the bathroom, but we're not gonna try and fix it ourselves again. Fun stuff about being a parent and a homeowner. Okay, let's actually talk about some books now. So I read a lot in March, and I did have a couple book slumps, but I did also read a lot of stuff that was short. So I have some classics, um, a lot of sci-fi fantasy, um, some mysteries, some romance, and nonfiction, which is odd for me. I don't usually have a ton of nonfiction, but I do this month. Let's go ahead and start with classics. So first off, for my Shakespeare play this month, I read Julius Caesar. Here's my large Shakespeare. It's like a funny thing. I keep showing you guys this because it's the exact same thing every time. There's no fancy cover with Julius Caesar on the cover. But um, it was the last major tragedy I hadn't read, which was nice for me to read. And I actually did a uh, video ranking Shakespeare's tragedies, which I will link in the description if you want to check it out. Sadly, Julius Caesar was probably my least favorite Shakespearean tragedy I've read, but that doesn't mean I didn't like it. I super love Shakespeare's tragedies, so it just didn't kind of stand up and hold up as much as like Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet and Othello do for me. It is basically the story of the fall of Julius Caesar and then the aftermath in Rome, which I was really familiar with because I was a history minor in college and um, kind of focused on ancient and medieval history and I took an entire class in the Roman Empire. I think that might have been part of the reason that I wasn't super into the place that I already knew exactly what was going to happen and I like knew what was going to happen with all these major characters because they are historical figures. That being said, I think this would be an amazing play to watch because there were a lot of great monologues in it and I feel like watching the tension on stage would be a little bit better than just reading it slash listening to it. Um, I did listen to the Shakespeare sessions again, which is what I use when I listen to a Winter's or The Winter's Tale in January. And I still think that they are great. They did a great production. Um, I just didn't kind of grab me as much as The Winter's Tale did. I would put this at like a solid, like probably like four stars, 3.75, four stars, like still a really great read. Didn't not like it, just didn't overly love it. Next for March, I was planning on reading Bride's Head Revisited as my classic. And um, as I said in my April TBR, because it's still on it, I did not finish it. And I really didn't finish it. When I filmed my April TBR, I was on, I think, page 40. And I said I was going to try to get to page 100 before March ended. And I'm currently on page 52. This book's a little bit slower than I was expecting. And it's just not grabbing me that much. The first chapter really grabbed me. And then we do a time jump and now I'm not as into it. I'm still gonna try to read it, but I honestly think this is gonna be one of those books that it takes me a really long time to read. I just read like a chapter here or there. So I might return it and buy it. <laughs> so I don't have to keep it out from the library for a very, very long time. Okay, next let's do mysteries. I had two mystery slash thrillers this month. One being The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. This was one of my book of the month picks in March. I did pick three, uh, but this is the only one I actually got to in March. The rest I will be reading in April. Um, I thought this was good. I didn't love it. So I was really excited to read this because I know a lot of people loved The Guest List, which I have not read. And so when I saw that it was the book of the month pick, it sounded really cool. It's kind of a hard book to describe but basically we follow multiple narrators and they all are staying in this apartment building in Paris. Our main narrator is Jess. She has come to stay with her half brother Ben and they've literally just talked and then she shows up and he's not there and he's not letting her in and she's kind of panicking because she's in Paris and she's not from Paris and she doesn't have anywhere to go and she needs him to help her out. She does get into his apartment and 
she can't find him. Then we switch to all these different point of views of different people that live in the apartment building also, and kind of what their relationship with Ben was. In terms of a thriller, I thought it was a little bit slow at the beginning. I thought the like first couple chapters were really engaging, but then it dragged a little bit in the middle. And I wasn't like, usually when I'm reading a thriller, I read it in like two days because you don't want to put it down. I didn't really feel that way with this book. It was fine. It had a good twist. The ending was very good, but it was sort of not like grabbing me as much as I wanted it to. Um, I don't think this is one that'll really like stick with me for a long time, but if you love mysteries, thrillers, if you like stuff set in Paris, I still would recommend it. I still liked this book. I just didn't love this book. My next mystery thriller I read, I had an arc for. So here's the beautiful cover and it is The Woman in the Library by Sulari Gentle, I believe is her name. I think that's how you say it, Sulari Gentile. Uh, I know you can see it on the cover. I'm really poor at pronouncing anything I haven't heard. I'm just like not a good visual re uh, reader that way. This book was a wild ride. <laughs> So it's not out yet. Um, it releases June 7th, but it is available to pre-order. And if you like mysteries that are sort of like really different, get this, pre-order it. Cause it was, it was so good. It was definitely a five-star read. So <laughs> the, the format of this book is what makes it crazy. So you start reading and it's just like this normal mystery where there's the, uh, this group of people that are in the Boston Public Library and they hear a scream and then they kind of like try to figure out what happens. But every chapter ends with an email from a beta reader. So being a writer, I'm familiar with this, but if you're not a beta reader is someone who, writers have relationships with people that um, they will send their stuff to as they're writing it or after they finished a draft or two to get feedback. And you usually send like a chapter at a time and you get feedback to make sure your, um, you know, your writing is making sense to someone else. And usually you have a really close relationship with these people, at least I do, but sometimes you don't. I have a few beta readers who I don't have close relationships with because you get more honest feedback. So at the beginning, you're kind of like, why are we getting this beta readers feedback? But then by the middle of the book, that becomes kind of more interesting than the mystery because it's like a mystery of its own. Oh my gosh, I can't like tell you that much be without giving away this book, but it was fan Fantastic. And definitely if you read it, read the afterword because it was wonderful reading the afterword as to how the author thought of this concept. Fantastic mystery, fantastic new format, five star read, loved it. Go pre-order it. I never do this, but I'll throw an Amazon link in the description for this book so you can pre-order it. Wonderful. Let's move on to sci-fi and fantasy, which I have three books in this category this month. Starting with The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. Um, Octavia Butler is most famous for writing Kindred. If you've heard of that, that's probably like her most famous book. This was recommended to me actually in a romance novel book group, even though it is not a romance and there really is no romantic subplot in it. <laughs> but um, I have to begin by telling you that there's like a ton of content warnings for this book. There is kind of like blasé description of rape, assault, there's a ton of murder. It's basically like the worst version of like post-apocalyptic America you could imagine. Everything's unsafe. There's a ton of drug use in it. There's arson, there's climate change. Like this really, every bad thing you could think of happening sort of happens in this book. Also just a major, major trigger warning. There is sexual assault of children in this book. Moving on from that. So this book was, kind of a hard one for me to review because I did find it very upsetting, but I also found it very well written. We follow Lauren and she's a teen. So we follow her for a few years. So she starts, I think at 15. And I think when the book ends, she's about 19 years old and she's living in this sort of middle of the apocalypse America. It takes place in the 2020s, which is also jarring to read, um, but it was written in the 90s. So it was written as like a futuristic story. And she lives in Southern California, which is pretty much like the worst place to live in America, as far as you can tell. Um, crime is unbelievable. She lives in a gated community and there are these communities that sort of try to protect themselves from the outside. But every day you hear of more and more of these communities as being like burned down and the people basically murdered and she is 
worried that that's going to happen to her community. So she kind of takes this um, stance that they should be more prepared to like go on the run. At the same time, Lauren's sort of inventing a religion, which this was the part of the book I didn't like as much because she's so young and she actually throughout the book gets people to follow her and listen to her and sort of like convert to this religion, which I had a difficult time with because I, you know, I'm not, this isn't a YA book, but like, you know, like I'm almost 40. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Listening to a 15 year old talk about a religion she's invented is kind of like not my cup of tea. If you like sort of survivalist stories, if you like harsh dystop like dystopia, like so harsh, not even really dystopian, more like apocalyptic stories, then you'd probably like this. Um, it's a duology, but I don't think I'll read the second one just because it was sort of hard to read all these horrible things happening. But that doesn't mean it wasn't really well written, and I still th I still think Octavia Butler's brilliant that she came up with this. But it was just a little too much for me to read, especially right now. My next book in this genre is A Song of Flight by Juliette Merlier, and this is another one that's very hard for me to review because Juliette Merlier is my favorite author of all time, and I didn't love this book. So, hmm. This is the last in a trilogy, and I'll be honest, the first book in this trilogy, which is called The Harp of Kings, I didn't love either. I thought it was a little bit slow. It didn't have as much of the like adoration I have of her books usually. But then the second book in this trilogy was really, really good, A Dance with Fate. It was one of my best books of 2021. So I was a little sad to find that, I, that this one just didn't do it for me. We follow um, several characters in this book, the main being Levin, Dow, and Brock. But we have some other narrators in this one, but they're not the main narrators of the series. Brock and Levin are sort of like adopted siblings. Levin's parents took Brock in. He is part fae, part human, and he has been living with the fae. We start this book with him being kind of cast out. There is a long through line in this series about the crow folk, the sort of invasive species that is suddenly in fantasy medieval Ireland attacking people and they're trying to figure out where these creatures came from why they're prone to such horrific violence and what to do this is a hard book to talk about without spoiling the first two books so i will say i liked the conclusion that the three main characters came into in their personal relationships with each other and with others but the plot of the book i didn't like as much as i liked dance with fate the second one and in terms of how I would rank Juliet and Merlier's series, which I will do a video on that because I've read them all, this one would definitely be towards the bottom because it just didn't, it didn't grab me like a lot of her other books did. I was even sadder because she did and asked me anything on Reddit and doesn't currently have a contract for any other books, which I just want her to keep writing. I love her books so much. I do think I'm going to reread some of her books that are my favorites this year just to give me like a little bit more of a fix. So that is Song of Flight by Juliet Merlier. My last sci-fi slash fantasy, but this one is sci-fi book of the year, or of the year, of March, we're nowhere near the end of the year, was Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. She wrote Station Eleven, which I read a really long time ago. I read it right when it came out. So that was like seven years ago, I think. And um, I liked that book. I loved this book. This was definitely a five-star read. It came out, I, I think, on April 5th or maybe like this week. So it's a new release. You can find it in bookstores and hardcover right now. It's wonderful. This is a book that's hard to talk about without giving away the plot. So I will tell you this. We jump through time. So for a little while, we're in the early 1900s. For a little while, we're in January 2020. For a little while, we're in tw like 2200 something, and then we're in 2400. So we go way far into the future we visit colonies that are new human uh, settlements in different parts of our solar system and beyond. Um, we follow different pandemics. And that was probably the most interesting. And there's a character in it who has written a book about a pandemic and then there's a pandemic. And that made me think that she probably drew a lot from her own experience of writing Station Eleven pretty soon before the pandemic we're currently still living in started 
and what that might have been like and in terms of like people wanting to interview her and wanting to ask her all these questions because she had wrote a fiction, written a fictionalized account of something that we were then living through. There were some lines in here that were so beautiful that I wrote them down, but they're spoilers, so I can't tell you what they are. But maybe in like a year, when I've given everybody a chance to read this book, I'll tell you some of my favorite lines because they're just so gorgeous and so poignant and so well written. And I kept wanting to tell my husband these lines, but he loves this this kind of literature. So I know I'm, he's gonna read this book, so I couldn't ruin it for him. I need to find someone who's read this book so we can talk about it. Five Star Read, fantastic. Definitely go get The Sea of, sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. If you like sci-fi, if you like futuristic, even if you like books that are just like about humanity, this book is wonderful. Moving on to romance. I only read one romance this month which is kind of low for me. And I do have like seven romances on my TBR for April to make up for it. But I read On the Way to the Wedding by Julia Quinn, which is the last in the Bridgerton series. I know that there are some like spin-off type books that are like prequels and stuff, but um, for the solid eight Bridgerton series, this was the last one. It is Gregory's book, who is the second youngest Bridgerton. Now, after I read Hyacinth's book, um, I was not sure if I was gonna read this book because I really didn't like Hyacinth's book at all. And it kind of put me off the Bridgertons. But then with um, the new season coming out, I figured I'm gonna read this book so that I can rank them all. And I was really glad I did because I did really enjoy this book. It was great. It had that Bridgerton feel where it's like spring and joyful and everything's bright, which I felt like is like the, the vibes of the whole Bridgerton series. Um, Gregory is a fun character. I would say he's sort of like Benedict adjacent in the series rather than in the books because Benedict's, Benedict's a little more zany in the series, which I like those kind of, you know, more outwardly romantic, outwardly sort of bohemian heroes in um, historical romance novels. The beginning of the book, I wasn't sure if I was gonna like it because it's kind of a weird setup that um, Gregory sees Lucy and her best friend and Lucy's the heroine of the book but he sees her best friend and is immediately in love with her <laughs> like wants to marry her so the beginning's a little weird because he's courting someone else which a lot of romance novels do start that way but Lucy was a fantastic heroine and she's been almost betrothed forever to a man she's never met and how she sort of falls in love with Gregory but then feels this huge weight of responsibility to actually marry the person she betrothed she is betrothed to um this was super fun I mean with the Bridgertons I feel like you either love them or you don't so if you're in the midst of the series and you're really liking it I would say that you're probably going to enjoy Gregory's book it was a fun read and lastly, I read nonfiction this month, which is odd for me, though one of them's not that odd. The first one I did was French love poems, which poetry is technically considered nonfiction. I'm a librarian, you shelve it in the nonfiction section. And I would say this book was okay, <laughs> it wasn't great. It's a collection of French poems translated into English. None of them really like hit me over the head as being like amazing. It was a fun little poetry read to do in March when I was craving to read some poetry. Would I? Recommend it, not particularly, it was fine. Next nonfiction that I do frequently read, I read The New Bohemians by Justina Blakenly. She um, does like bohemian design, this is an interior design book, and she did Jungalo, which I can think I can see right there, which I absolutely adore. So I wanted to check out her other book. This one came out first. Sorry, I just dropped a book. This one came out first and I grabbed it from the library and I just really like the bohemian style and she does a lot more like eclectic bohemian and not just like the neutrals California bohemian, which I thoroughly enjoy. It was a really fun book to look through and um, her own house is in here as well as like the house of her sister and a lot of her friends. And if you really like this style, I always think like house books are so much fun to get because you just kind of like stare at other people's well decorated and staged living rooms and i like doing that so this was super fun and then lastly which this is funny because i think i actually read this book first i think this i read this was the first book i read in march is intimations by zadie smith this is a collection of essays that zadie smith wrote during the beginning of the pandemic and um i really liked it it's very well written and it was interesting to read as a writer because she talks about lots of different subjects in this book but one of the things she goes over is um creators and trying to create during the pandemic, which was great for me to read because I actually um, 
So I wrote a book in January, 2020, and then I didn't, I couldn't write anything new the rest of the year. I, and it made me really worried that I was never gonna be able to write a book again, but I um, would edit stuff that I had written and I tried to write a book in April, 2020, which didn't happen. I wrote like, you know, the first couple chapters and then I just couldn't do it. And she talks a lot about like, when you're faced with this unending amount of time and everyone's telling you like, this is the time you've always wanted to do this. You've always wanted to learn how to whatever play the piano. You've always wanted to learn how to embroider. You've always wanted to learn how to bake this. And now you have all this time stretched out in front of you and how it wasn't really easy for anyone to take that time and do anything meaningful with it because we just had this, you know, cloud of horror over us because it was because of a pandemic. She also has a lot of great essays on classism, racism, just what it meant for her raising her small children and being um, a writer and a working mom. And I, I really enjoyed this. It was a really fast read. I read, I think I read it in two days because I didn't sit down and read it straight through. And I was like taking breaks, like I'd read an essay, put it down, do the dishes or whatever, and then read another one, put it down, put my kids to bed. So it was kind of that kind of book, but a really great short read. I mean, if you're looking for something like, I feel like if you have like a short train ride or plane ride where you're going to be traveling and you're only going to need something that's going to take you like an hour ish to read, grab this. It was great. Those are my March reads. So I did read a lot, some stuff very short, some stuff great, some stuff not so great. Um, but overall, I think it was a pretty good reading month. I wouldn't change anything. I do wish that I had read another one of my book of the month books because I didn't find the Paris apartment that engaging and, um, but you know, it is what it is. It's always a crapshoot when you get those books, whether or not you're gonna love them or not. But um, hopefully the other two I bought that month, I'm gonna completely adore. If you've made it this far in the video, I thank you for watching this far. Thank you for listening to me complain about illness and plumbing at the beginning of the video. And I hope you are in the middle of reading a good book, about to start reading a good book or about to start writing a great book. See you soon.